Hey everyone, it's Scott from CertMedia.com, and today I'm going to be going over the Hummingbird Speed Optimized Cache Minify script from WPMU Dev. This is a freemium plugin found at the WordPress.org repository that has both a paid version and a free version. We will be reviewing the freed version today. If you want to pay for the premium version, you are able to do so on their website. I'll include a link to it. But for now, let's jump into the free version. Hummingbird is a mixed plugin I've had experience with. It's not the best plugin at what it does from my own experience, but it's simple and yet complicated at the same time. And you're going to see what I mean. To install, just go to plugins, add new, search for Hummingbird and install it the standard way. Once you do so, you're going to get a new dashboard called Hummingbird. And it's going to take you through an interesting little page. It's going to tell you to, you can skip the, skip the quick setup, which we're going to do for the sake of this video. And you can run a performance test, which will help analyze and point out issues that it can fix. And it's probably going to upsell you on the premium version to fix additional issues. There are some features in here that are pretty solid. And you're going to see what I mean. First of all, let's run the performance test. It's going to run a hand, go ahead and run it. Any day now. Website ain't isn't that heavy. I think this is just an empty website right now. Maybe with the default 2018 info. So it scored 100 out of 100. Let's see why. Ah, oh, this page is empty. All right, that's fine. We don't need to worry too much about it. All the opportunities, it looks like it's measuring in line with what PageSpeed Insights recommends. So that's really good. You will almost never get a 90 or more, but let's just skip past this for now. And let's talk about caching. So the first thing you get under caching is page caching. Page caching is the same as it is for all plugins. It will save a static version of the page in, as HTML, and it will save it on the server and use rewrites through your HD access file to serve it. You're gonna go ahead and wanna activate this, and then you can go into the sub options and choose the page types that you wanna cache. You can also declare the variable do not cache page, tell to not cache that specific page via PHP and you can select the page type so pretty much all of these would want to be cached in our in our website and in most websites you can enable preloading cache what this will do is it will automatically reach out to pages archives and other items you told it to index and it will go ahead and preload them so that way it serves the when that first visitor visit your, visits your website instead of the cached version being generated then it'll already be generated and served to them. Clear the cache on a regular interval. This can be done. Um, if you cleared the cache too frequently though, you can run into server issues. They recommend 30 days. Actually the default's 30 days, but we recommend setting the interval to no less than 24 hours. They are indeed correct though that setting it too short can impact your server performance. Having integrations, if you have varnish set up on your server, then you should go ahead and check this option. It doesn't seem to do any checking out of the box, which is something that I'm a little disappointed in. I would expect it to know if the server is doing varnish, it has varnish on it already, or at least can register that op cache is enabled. WordPress Rocket, by comparison, one of their competitors, I believe has that functionality. And I think there are some of the free plugins on the market that currently are able to detect like W3 Total Cache. But we wouldn't want to enable this since the server does have it because it's on SiteGround. Under settings, you can include logged in users to the cache. I would not recommend this. When you enable caching for logged in users, what will often happen is they will get served a static version of the page, which can really mess it up, particularly on WooCommerce websites. If you do this on a WooCommerce website and you allow users to log in and make an account, you're going to get really bad experiences for those users they may not be able to check it out properly they may not be able to visit their account page the only time that this is somewhat useful is if you run a membership website where the only difference is, is when they're logged in they're actually able to visit the content otherwise there's no reason to use this you can cache url queries with a get parameter this is not a particularly good idea as they say the reason for this is, is when you cache urls with a query string or a get parameter What's gonna happen is that you're typically doing a dynamic request, kind of like when you do a search on WordPress, it'll do question mark S equals, and then it'll do your search query. This would cache that version. And the problem is, is they're inherently supposed to be dynamic. 
So when you do this, you can break the functionality of those pages, or if you get a lot of bots that hit the server, you may end up overloading your server by creating tons of pages, or your users will just get an empty page or those pages are not properly updated. I don't recommend doing this. So you can cache 404 requests as well. Even though for, and as it mentions, even though 404s are bad and you'll want to avoid them with redirects, you can choose to cache your 404 page to avoid additional load. Caching your 404 page is a good idea, but their suggestion is also totally valid. If you have 404s and you have a valid page that it should be pointing to, you should fix it. But 404s are not bad inherently. A 404 page is a good indicator that a piece of content no longer exists. If you're 301 redirecting everything to your homepage, you're actually in trouble because you're telling Google that this piece of content is now your homepage, and if the content's not similar, the redirect isn't doing you any favors. You're just causing your users to have really poor experience. You can enable a debug log as well if you need to. You don't normally have to enable this. It's just not necessary. There's an, I, in the pro version, it has the functionality to identify cache pages. What it'll basically do is just insert a comment. Um, it's, it's nothing that's important. They're giving you most of the meat and potatoes here with the page caching. Serve the compressed version of the com uh, pages. So what this will do is it will enable gzip compression and serve the gzip version of the page to your users. It can also enable caching for in an mobile devices or you can just disable it if you wish. The only thing you need to disable it is if you have a specific mobile specific theme that you need to serve to them, but you don't, most people don't need to do this anymore. You can clear the cache on comment post. It will clear that post, its cache, if there's a comment that's submitted. This is a good thing because it allows the user to get a clear understanding that their comments is either being held for moderation where the comment was already posted. And that way it allows the page to be still responsive. One thing to keep in mind though, is if you have a lot of comments all the time, you may want to look at either using an Ajax form or using something like Discus just to offload it. But that's only if you have a substantial amount of comments. You can exclude URL strings here and then you can add a wildcard if you wish. So if you wish to not cache your forums, you would just do as it said, and this would exclude your forums. You can specify user agents that you don't want to send cache pages to. So they've added a couple common ones here, Slurp, Crawl, Spider, Yandex. Now, the problem is if you have a lot of bot traffic, serving a cache page is actually recommended because if you don't, you're going to just be hitting your server with a bunch of dynamic requests whenever Googlebot wants to roll into town and index your latest content. But what you do in that setting is ultimately up to you. Sometimes though, uh, they have, if you add a, like a, something like ahrefs, if you wanna disallow that so that way it's getting the most recent version all the time, go ahead and do so. Under browser caching, you have the ability to set expired setters. They recommend it being eight days and the current expiry is one year, one year, one year, and two months. This is correct. You want to have the expiry and it's set effect effectively as far out as it can be because it doesn't matter to the user all that much. You can set the expiry here as well. I'm just gonna set it to one year. We need to update your HD access. View the code, all right, whatever. Doesn't seem like this option is working. It says that the server is Nginx, but it actually is Apache. Copy the generated code into your HT access file and save your changes, and then you can restart Apache. This is not very user friendly. It should automatically inject that, in my opinion, but that's where you're at. Gravatar caching is actually really useful. What this will do is, particularly on comment pages, it will cache the gravatar of the user commenting so that way it's being served from your domain. The advantage here is two things. Number one, you can compress that gravatar if needed. Number two, you actually it's a few things. You can set the expires headers and the browser caching headers for your user 
that way that the image can be cached longer than the default gravatar amount. And you can also serve it from your CDN, which oftentimes could either be faster or slower depending on what kind of CDN you're using. If you're using Cloudflare, for instance, and you use the Pro version, which generates WebP images, this will allow the gravatars to be served as WebP from the Cloudflare CDN, and they'll have the expired header set correctly. That's just a much better solution than default gravatar. So I recommend enabling this. In my opinion, it should be enabled out of the box, but sometimes, depending on your theme, it may not work. RSS caching, this is a very simple and straightforward and awesome functionality. It will cache your RSS feeds to reduce loads. Most people don't subscribe to RSS feeds anymore. For those who do, this will reduce the load on your server, particularly because it's a common means of bots trying to scrape. So it's just overall a good thing to do. You can enable admin cache control, which will add a clear cache button at the top of the admin bar. I mean, I, I don't care that much about this functionality. You'll almost never need to manually clear it, but if you wish to, you may. Once you save that, you can go ahead and reload this. And now under Hummingbird, you can clear your page cache. I'm gonna turn it off because I don't like my admin bar being cluttered. And under file change detection, choose how Hummingbird will react when it detects changes to your file structure. I recommend setting this to automatic. It will automatically then clear the cache and you don't have to do anything. Gzip. You wanna make sure your Gzip is functioning. It looks like it's functioning because it, the rules were already added server side. But if you do, it's just gonna spit out a line of HD access that it wants you to import. I wish it did this automatically. It should do it automatically, but I digress. Asset optimization. Now this is where you're gonna get the interesting stuff. Asset optimization, first of all, it'll run a check to see what files that it detects can be optimized. If you've ever used auto-optimize, it's very similar to that in principle. They mention it can break themes. They are not wrong. You can break your site very easily. And we're gonna just briefly go through it because this is the most basic theme that I could have. So it mentions the files that are already compressed, but the 2020 style is not compressed. So we can actually com compress all of the files that are not compressed and you'll be able to tell because it'll warn you. It doesn't recompress files that have .min in the URL. So these files have .min, but 2020 is index.js is not marked with .min. And jQuery.js, despite it being minified, isn't marked with .min in the URL structure, so it doesn't ignore it. We're gonna go ahead and publish those changes. So, and it looks like it's worked. So if I find, there you go. This was where the main CSS file was, and it's clearly been compressed by Hummingbird. You can also enable an advanced mode, which I will go through this. So when you enable advanced mode, you're able to do uh, merging of files in addition to minification. Merging of files is actually still incredibly useful, even in HTTP2 environments. And the reason for this is because when you have HTTP2, you're still gonna benefit from the compression ratios of files that are being served with GZIP, which sounds like a mouthful. But all that it means is when you compress something with GZIP, you tend to get better, you tend to get a smaller file the larger the file was to, in to be initially. And that's because a lot of code tends to be redundant. And so when it's being compressed through GZIP or broadly, the total ended up file tends to be smaller. So if I combined all these files and served them, the total file it would probably be smaller merged than if each file was served without gzip individually. And we can test this real quick just to prove a point. So if right now I'm gonna reload the page and we're just gonna see how much it says there is. It says there's 56.8 kilobytes out of 480 kilobytes transferred. So 56.8 kilobytes came from CSS files. What we're gonna do is we're gonna check these options and we're going to combine them. And then we're gonna click publish changes. So 56.8 kilobytes. This didn't work. Oh, because it didn't undo dash icons, it looks like. Hmm. Oh, it didn't merge this file either. What is it doing? Let's try this again. It still doesn't look like it's working. 
Let's try it in incognito mode just to exclude the possibility of it being an issue while it's logged in. Otherwise, I'm going to say that this is probably a bug. So let's clear our hummingbird cache. This is the one time when you'd actually want it to be in your header when it's not working correctly. All right, now let's take a look, shall we? All right, it looks like it's not playing well at all. The point still stands though of typically when you compress the files, it would end up yielding a smaller compression size. This is very weird in its lack of workingness. It seems like it's just not doing it even at look. It's, it's merged the admin bar and the WordPress block their library CSS in this file, and yet it doesn't seem to be doing its job even a little. Not even a little. Okay, we're gonna skip past it, but typically you'll, you'll have to play around with the option or you'll have to have somebody else optimize your website. I'm not sure what its issue is at the moment, but I don't wanna have to keep trying to debug the issue. You can do the same thing with your JavaScript files. Typically what you'll want to do is do everything but jQuery and we're going to just merge these files and we're going to combine them all and then what we're going to do is we're going to stick them all into the footer. Move to the footer, move to the footer. And the reason for this is on most websites when you're working with jQuery if you don't exclude it from being combined, you'll get jQuery errors. So, okay. Again, it seems like it's like doing a half job. I'm not particularly sure what its issue is, but as I've said, I don't wanna sit here trying to debug it. It seems to be an issue with the combining files. Not particularly sure why. Under the tools section though, you can add CSS to be loaded above the fold. So if you move all your CSS to the fold, what will happen is you'll get a flash of unstyled content. If you inline CSS into the header, that's your critical CSS, this will resolve the issue. This plugin does not help you find that critical CSS and doing so is very difficult and very much hit or miss depending on your theme. Under the settings window, you basically get a couple options that only apply to the pro version, which includes access to their CDN and a better compression ratios. Under the advanced tools, you actually get some really useful features. So removing the URL, uh, the query strings from URLs will help clear out a warning NGT matrix. You should remove the emoji JS if you can. You can put prefetch DNS requests in here if you need and if you notice that there are some that need to be added. And you can ex disable the WooCommerce cart fragments if you're using WooCommerce. If you're using WooCommerce, you'll know what that item is because it takes like four seconds and it's under waterfall. This way it'll allow you to disable it. You'll also get database cleanup. Database cleanup just allows you to easily clean out common items that are not necessary. For instance, you will have your transients, which can be deleted. And you just click here, you can click delete entries and it will automatically delete them. In addition to that, you can clean out draft posts, revisions, trashed posts, and various forms of comments. And then there is a delete all if you wish to just delete all of them. In the pro version, you can schedule them. System information just includes some basic system information that is used to help them debugging issues when you're having them. The uptime monitor in the pro version allows you to know if your website goes down. You do not get that in the free version, but it's not really a performance oriented feature. So it's perfectly acceptable they don't provide that. And then under the settings, you basically get the common settings that WPMU Dev provides for accessibility, your data, and your general settings to either uninstall data when you remove it or to keep the data. I always recommend deleting the data when you install it, when you uninstall it. And then as always, there's the obligatory ad for why the pro version is worth your money. And the pro version does come with some useful features, but from a free version's perspective, 
This plugin is just fine. If you have any questions about it, you can feel free to ask me in the comment section below. I will try to help you out as best I can. If you also experience issues with the asset optimization, do let me know. I'm extremely curious as to why it's not merging my files. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and goodbye.